Um, all right, this looks like everybody for now. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the week off last week. Um, I was able to attend the Housing Finance Authority webinar. Really interesting and dynamic guy. Um, yeah, that was probably the most fun presentation I've had about economics in a bit. Um, so if you weren't able to make it and you're able to get a hold of a recording, um, I highly recommend it. Um, it was actually more focused on um, you know, the general economic outlook for the next year or so than it was necessarily on housing. Yeah, I don't care. I just don't, I just want to, I'm thinking way ahead say someone says, okay. Morning, Ben. How much do we get? Um, like, I don't know, because this is what. Ben, would you mind muting? Thank you. Um, so yeah, definitely take a look if you were able to um, find that recording. And if I see it distributed, I'll be sure to pass that back around to everybody. So where we left off a couple of weeks ago, um, we were sort of fine tuning our um, potential projects that we might uh, consider working into a proposal for BEA for the $50,000 they have available for CEDARS. Um, and we had discussed, uh, yeah, BEA would like us to limit our proposals to um, a maximum of three separate items, just from a reporting and logistics standpoint on their end. Um, so it's easier to track things for their reporting requirements. Um, so we had suggested focusing on sort of an administrative category that would um, support continued facilitation of this group, um, as well as two other working groups that were focused on um, general workforce development education kind of programming and um, quality of place, uh, sort of marketing of this Seacoast collectively that we could use either to, oh great, Nancy looks like she um, found, uh, looks like the slides from the presentation. Um, uh, the, the second project was looking at marketing the quality of life in the seacoast that um, we as chambers or municipalities might be able to use to attract businesses, but also thinking about how to take those um materials and make them available to businesses as they are recruiting um, their own workers and their own talent so um we wanted to circle back to those three projects this week um sort of talk through things i think for all of them we uh were sort of thinking of the initial rough draft of a scope um, so I'm not expecting anybody to have sort of finished polished budgets or anything like that. Um, but I think from our conversation this week, we are hoping to have some direction on how to further refine those, um, and whether we should, uh, go ahead and start, you know, putting the proposal paperwork together for BEA for those next steps. Um, so because I get to set the agendas, I took the liberty of putting myself first. Um, so unless there are any initial questions, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start talking through the sort of facilitation and administration. All right, seeing none. Um, you all should have gotten this spreadsheet sometime yesterday afternoon, um, but there's a fair amount going on. So like I said, I will walk you all through what I did to put this together. So on the first page, um, you know, there were some questions last time about you know, just what has it cost us so far to keep this group running in this format on a weekly basis? Um, so I went back through SRPC's payroll. We've called this thing, you know, different things over the course of the last 22 months. Um, so I was sort of looking back through our economic development staff's 
um, you know, timesheet notes for how we've coded things, um, you know, to four different federal grants that we've had that have um, supported us in this over the course of almost two years. Um, so over that time, we've put in over a thousand hours of staff time, totaling $68,600 um, in terms of staffing that we've put into attending these, setting up agendas, um, you know, working on some of the follow-up items that this group has come up with. Um, it's not a perfect one-to-one -one timeline because of how we've done records, but then generally over the same time frame, that has been um, 89 meetings that we have records of through the end of last month, um, 1,400 total attendees, that's all of you, um, for about 127 unique individuals. Um, some of those have been people who have stopped in for one or two meetings. You know, some of those are, um, you know, those of you that have been on, on almost all of these. Um, none of this data is you know, completely perfect, but in terms of my complete best effort to figure out what have we contributed and what have we been able to pull together, this is it. So any questions about this before I switch to sort of forward looking? Okay. So then thinking about um, how we would want to proceed if this were um, to continue to be a weekly call over the next year. Um, I've generally blocked out uh, for a duration, that's how much I expect the task to take um, sort of for each call. Um, the rate is using SRPC's general billing rates. If we were to break this out for a proposal, um, we would probably ask REDC and RPC for their specific billing rates for an actual project proposal. Um, for a back of the napkin estimate, I've just used ours um, and approximated for staff that don't work for SRPC. Um, the count then is um, you know, the number of meetings, assuming we meet every week um, in this case, or for some of the coordination meetings, assuming that we meet quarterly. Um, so if you think about for every week, we have to prepare an agenda, distribute the agenda. Um, we're assuming that we're committing sort of two people for each call, somebody to moderate, somebody to um, be the one taking the notes, typing them up, distributing them. Um, and then we also wanted to make sure that we had um, some funding allocated to assume that you know, both REDC and Rocking and Planning Commission were able to continue to participate and assist with facilitation as well. Um, and then we do minor video editing to compile the um, recording of each meeting get it posted to our YouTube channel um, and then compiling and sending out all of those notes on the back end. Um, quarterly uh, coordination meetings, those aren't something that we do regularly right now, um, but they are something that I have sort of been feeling the need for. Um, a lot of times the agendas are sort of living in my head until I'm able to go and type them up. Um, and so something like this would give me the ability to sit down with, you know, some of the other people at RPC and REDC who are, um, you know, we're hoping going to take a, a larger role in assisting with the coordination and facilitation um, and sort of plan out a schedule and put together a calendar and say, we're, we're targeting this for this meeting. We want to you know, get a series of speakers together for um, a couple of months from now, et cetera. Um, and then we had also talked about um, a number of sort of smaller implementation actions that we wouldn't necessarily need to set aside funding for in their own right, um, that we might be able to sort of package under this administrative item and say, as part of facilitation, we will be making progress on you know, several of these items. 
Um, there was a highlighted list on the agenda from, I think, two weeks ago that was suggesting you know, examples of some of those things we might be able to tackle under this budget. Um, some of them were, um, you know, for example, working with uh, the Seacoast Rail Trail um, and sort of coordinating uh, your conversion of walking trails and things like that. And so thinking about the existing process and the existing funding for that, uh, maybe presenting to all of you so you were aware of um, you know, some of the MPO funding opportunities or, or funding processes that that has already experienced, but then thinking about how to coordinate beyond that with um, some of the other projects that communities in our region may be doing. Um, so we had some time set aside for some of those selected activities. Um, we also assume, assumed for this conversation that um, you know, maybe we would identify and go after one additional funding opportunity in the next year, um, similar to how we went after the Build Back Better opportunity. Um, and so we wrote that in as if um, some combination of rocking and planning and SRPC were um, the lead applicants and grant writers for an opportunity like that. And then finally, we have a few lines down at the bottom that would cover SRPC acting as the fiscal agent for the entire CEDARS proposal. Um, so that's generally about an hour a month for uh, our executive director and our finance manager. Um, just for general grant administration billing, et cetera. Um, so that's all on the uses side. The uses is everything that I'm assuming that we're doing. The sources side then is how we're breaking out um, how we would pay for it. As I said last time, SRPC does receive some standard um, planning assistance as an economic development district from US EDA. We are willing to continue to kick in some of that funding. Um, so where I've marked EDD funds, that's assuming uh, one call a month that we would continue to contribute under that funding source. Um, but that funding source covers all of our economic development technical assistance. It covers um, our annual updates to our comprehensive economic development strategy. That is about sort of the, the limit of what we could continue to devote um, on a regular basis to operating this group. Uh, the CARES funds, both REDC and SRPC as economic development districts have received a CARES Act grant um, to sort of ramp up some of those activities under COVID. Um, so for SRPC, we received our grant a little bit later than most economic development districts. That money runs through the end of September of 2022. Um, and we, again, are willing to assume that most of our participation in calendar 22 would continue to use that CARES Act funding while it exists. Um, so I have generally blocked the remainder of the first three quarters um, to our CARES Act assistance. So between these two sources, that should cover three quarters worth of meetings and then three meetings for the final quarter. Um, for REDC, I think their funding would expire at the end of June um, because most economic development districts receive that funding before we did. Yeah, I think it's the end of May, I think, for us. Yeah. End of May. It's yeah. the end of May. Ours started June 1st. Okay. Then I am probably a month off in terms of what I've blocked out here, but you know, for purposes of today, that's probably close enough. Um, so then the gap uh, is thinking about what's left for calendar year 22 um, if we want to. Uh, continue to meet weekly and accomplish everything that we hope to accomplish under this uses budget. Um, th that's basically the, the gap that we would be looking to fill with the CEDARS funding for administration. 
Um, so currently, as I've laid it out, it comes to just under $23,000 for the remainder of the year. Um, so I know it, it seemed like last time we sort of wanted to talk through and get a, our heads around um, this cost before we went over and discussed some of the other costs for the other programming. Um, so at this point, I guess I would open things up to questions, discussion, thoughts, ideas. Um, or we could hear from some of the other groups. Robin, I see you first. I guess, uh, James, I'm kind of wondering, what is the implication if this funding source in this manner does not occur? What are the consequences uh, and implications? If, if we do not get additional funding beyond our standard ED, EDD money and our standard CARES Act grants, SRPC won't be able to keep running these calls on a weekly basis. Um, so- and James, which, I'm sorry. So I would say, we, as we've laid it out with the EDD funds and the CARES funds, um, you know, basically we could keep doing this weekly through the end of September of 2022. Um, and at that point, the way that we have our budget internally, we would need to drop these down to monthly. Okay, understood. This is a pretty easy decision, frankly, easy. 25K, roll with it. Right, um, well, I, I do want to point out that that would be 25K of gap funding for this year um, for 2022, because we do have a little bit more resources than we usually do. Um, but yeah, I would also sort of throw out to have in the back of your mind, um, you're right now, the way I've laid out the uses, the number is... 42,000 for you know, 2023 and beyond that we would be able to cover even less of that gap. So yeah, I think um, we, we tackle that funding for next year. I think the BEA is gonna support the Cedars probably as long as uh, Sununu is in office. So, so James, um, my only question, and again, I have no say in what grants they're going to approve or, or fund, but, my only question is, um, let's say next year it's one quarter's worth that you're saying um, to use funding for 22,000, 25,000 roughly, one mm -hmm. quarter's worth of meetings and uh, activities, right? It sort of depends on the organization. So okay. on the out on column Z, we've got the recipient for SRPC, we can keep these going and we would be looking for one quarter's worth of assistance. Um, but you know, we've also talked about, can we get some funding for um, Rockingham Planning Commission so they would be able to share some of these responsibilities. They, don't, they are not an economic development district because they're contained within REDC's service area. Um, so they would be looking at basically 12 months of that funding to um, sort of support their increased support of this group. Uh, down here, we have sort of blocked out, assuming this breakout, how much would be passing through to each organization. Um, and we're assuming that that would sort of be sub-recipients, you know, SRPC would be the fiscal agent for this sort of task and it would be on us to handle the pass through to the other organizations. Okay, okay. And that's not, so the one quarter's worth of what you're proposing to use from the BEA grant, the CEDAR grant, um, it does also have in, it's not just meetings, right? So I Correct. can see here that it's, you know, if there's grant writing and there's things like that. So I think I would just suggest to make that point really clear that it's not just administration or point out that it's, you know, that you're guesstimating there'd be some activity in terms of grant writing and advocacy 
yep. that are going to fall, but you can't guarantee that it's just going to fall into the, you know, the, fir- the fourth quarter or one quarter, right? Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, so these lines here, 22 through 24, um, you know, those are sort of focused on that broader implementation of some of those smaller items. Um, if we were drawing this up as a proposal for BEA, I would have actually taken the time to go back to that agenda from a couple of weeks ago and pulled all of those items and written them up. Um, I didn't have the chance to do that for this morning, but if you'd like me to, you know, if the group would like me to move forward with the next step, sort of more detailed proposal, that's definitely going to be one of the first things that I do is laying out all of those other things that we're hoping to implement as part of yeah. um, you know, this set of activities. Warren, I think that's the key point. I would make sure that you are not saying using BEA, the grant, CEDAR grant for administration or facilitation of meetings. There's other things in there, that's all. Yeah, and I mean, the, the truth is some of those um, implementation things are going to be handled through the facilitation of meetings and, and connecting this group to those other efforts, et cetera, et cetera. Warren? Yeah. yeah, I think this is put, this is really um, easily understood and, and very well put together. Thank you, James. I just also want to recognize the fact that SRPC has has done this without, you know, had through their budget for 2020 and 2021. And, you know, you have put this together. We've met for the most part weekly and thank thankfully, we are here today, and uh, number one, we're still talking to each other. <laughs> but number two, number two, you know, you've created this cohesive group that are, that are all working together, and we identified a problem years back that cities and towns don't talk to each other, and we're not collaborating on on a regional basis, and we are now, and that that you know, SRPC has has carried that financial burden for two years now. So I like to see that. I agree. Um, call it call it twenty five thousand. Let's let, let's go with twenty five thousand dollars and call it a day. And it still leaves us with twenty five thousand dollars to do some of the other work that we we need to do over um, the course of the year. But I, I have a question. I'm going to hold on to. And maybe Teresa can answer that, or maybe somebody else can. Um, so, and in, I'm not really worried about twenty twenty three. There are there'll be grant opportunities out there, um, and Maybe we meet. Maybe we're at the point where we meet biweekly, so that whole line three through through eleven can go to half of what it is. So I'm, I'm not at all concerned about 2023. But my question is, Cedar, does that have to be spent by the end of the fiscal year or the calendar year? My understanding was December 31st of 22. Good. Okay. Which is why I set this out the way I did. We sort of went back and forth about would we want to show you calendar 22? Would we want to show you SRPC's fiscal year 23? That would be July 1 to June 30. Um, and our understanding of how the CEDARS funding was going to work was why we did it the way we did. So any other yeah, comments, James, questions? Yeah, let me add one thing, James. Um, I think it would be completely appropriate if we're talking 2023, 2024, that some of the communities that are involved with this, if we needed funding, would, would put some or could put some forward. I think it'd be a pretty easy sell for me to go to the board and ask them for 10K to throw, throw at this you know, on an annual basis. So if that, if that has to happen, I think we'll find the funding somewhere for sure. I just want to go on record, Darren. I love you to death. I love all of you. There is, but I'll just tell you right now, Summersworth would not write a check for yeah. any of us. <laughs> we know that. We know that. <laughs> okay. As long as you yeah. know that. And, and yeah, you brought that up last time as well, Darren. And I think um, yeah, if you were willing, we would certainly be grateful and we would be interested to have that conversation, but the logistics of how that's going to work and who pays how much and what happens if people don't chip in. And I think that's several months worth of conversations right there. Um, so if that's a route that we, you know, I, I, 
I'm not overly concerned about 23 at this point. We've got a whole year between now and then as well. Um, but I did want to at least mention that um, 22 is going to be an abnormal year and this is a lower ask than what we would typically need for the same level of service in case we needed to have several months of those conversations toward the end of next year. That works. I think it looks great. And I really appreciate all that um, the regional planning commissions have done to keep this collaboration going. I just, one point I would just make if we, if we are gonna ask communities going forward, we just need to do it in a timely way so we can put something in our budgets um, when it goes to council for approval. It's easier to, it's easier to do it in advance than it is to, um, to not do it that way. Yep. Hey, James, I just wanted to jump in and thanks. I know we, you and I, or Jen and I had talked about this yesterday. I know she, she passed that on to you. Um, you know, I just, the one thing that that will be different or could, could make a difference, I think, to a lot of the, the group is that, you know, your capacity by having the resources of RPC funded, it, it, it could change, you know, even the, the, the capacity of what we can actually accomplish um, by having my staff on with SRPC, um, it's, it, it's a bit of a game changer if we can do this. I, we've been here, I've been here mostly, I've been sort of hiding amongst my other grants to get my time in here and, and help out whenever I can, but um, it'll make a difference. So I, I'm glad that the overall uh, sentiment is to support it and uh, let's move forward and see if we can't get it done. All right, so it sounds like I'm getting a consensus that you would like me to move forward with a more formal set of paperwork and whether we you hold that while we you f finish developing the other um, projects or whether we put that in um, while we keep working on those. Um, yeah, I can at least have something for you all to sort of take a final look at in the next week or so. Does that sound good? I'm seeing some heads, some thumbs. Okay. It does sound good, but could could you maybe also have an alternate of every other week for a meeting? Uh, I mean, I can show you what that would look like right now. Uh, it looks like some of the pull across is broken. So the total huh. I think Jen changed a few things when she tweaked this. So the total drops by about 12,000, um, which would mean the gap would also drop by about 12,000. James, to, um, sorry to interrupt your train of thought, but I think it might be helpful to, to somewhere have um, an aspirational uh, goal statement, only to the extent of who is funding it and what is the summation of it. So maybe it's a very short vision statement, one sentence. Where is this money coming from? Who are you applying for money from for this? to clearly articulate that. Yeah, um, I think my, the first thing I'm probably gonna do for this is touch base with Teresa. I'm not sure whether she's sent me the paperwork um, for the BEA uh, proposal before, but um, I would wanna take a look at the format of what they're expecting um, and start pulling those materials uh, together the way they would want it. Um, and if that isn't clear, I can, uh, in what they're looking for, I could put together a cover sheet or something that has just the quick and dirty, like you asked. It's very easy, James. It's all online. I will send you the link so you can Perfect. upload stuff, but it's, we tried to make it as simple and easy as possible. Okay. Cool. Are we ready to move on? I think I had the workforce development group up second.
Sure, James. Can, I don't know if you want to. Can you pull up what I sent you for people? To just... uh, yeah, let me stop sharing my spreadsheet. And uh, I. You want me to just share it again? Sure, please. There you go. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so Warren and Nancy and I met, I'll just, I'll start off and ask them to kick in here as we uh, kind of talk through this. And it, it's a pretty general um, outline of, of, we took the two points, the, the two ideas, the first one to educate employers on the value of investing in current employees. And you can see there, some of the ideas we had. Um, and it really does um, talk about engaging employers. And I think what we all agreed on it in kind of in a different way, because I think what we heard, what I heard on the uh, presentation last week, la that last Tuesday, I did, I did listen to it, is the supply of labor problem is not going away. So if those, those employers that don't wanna do anything differently are gonna to continue to be frustrated and, um, and challenged. So really that first one is to talk to them about different ways of, of attracting employees, of investing in their current employees, of gaining productivity that way, um, and, and potentially creating different ways for them to, to grow their business uh, in spite of this, uh, the, supply chain, the supply of labor shortage. Um, we didn't get to the dollar amount, but you can see we, we talked about distributing videos and, and resources, um, kind of maybe collecting some things that are already in place and, and finding a way to um, en enhance or yeah, create some new videos to, to share with employers. Um, and the second piece is, is to talk about you know, promoting forums and events, which, which would also take some some dollars and some coordination, uh, whether it be a hiring someone or um, a firm to help us do that. But uh, those are, I'll let you all just kind of comment on that, Nancy and, and Warren, if you have anything to, to, to add, but it really does become a way for us to engage employers differently and uh, recognizing that some will be interested, some will have the capacity and others will just continue to do what they're doing. Yeah, we talked about delivery method and, and what the best way is to get that information out. And uh, Sean actually sent us a couple of short videos that he did that Nancy and I were both very impressed with. Um, and um, so how do we get that information out? You know, people are webinared out, they're busy, getting information out through any platforms that are available. We haven't identified what that is yet through all of our, uh, our social media, our websites, if that's possible. Certainly the SBDC would, would be able to provide the information, but potentially hiring a firm to put together these short videos on best practices, whether they're, um, whether they're actually uh, success stories or whether they're professional development around uh, some people within this team or outside of this team who understand what it takes to attract and retain employees. And we would coordinate that with the, with the, um, the um, paper version or the PDF version that the other group is working on as, as well as if possible. So you're still sort of thinking that the, the purpose behind the campaign and the target audience for the campaign is Hey, C-level executives, hey, plant managers, hey, hiring managers, you're going to need to change how you think about attracting, hiring, and retaining talent. Um, please sort of become aware of this new reality. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I, I think we had a little bit of a discussion about um, everybody's got to have skin in the game in solving this problem. And, you know, we can do what we can do on our end, but some of it um, is going to rely on the business and, and how they, uh, 
they go about attracting or taking an inward look at the culture of their, their company um, in terms of retention, that type of thing. If I may just throw in there, just remember the Portsmouth Chamber has 800 members, the Dover Chamber has 500 members, the Rochester Chamber has around 500 members. I think that um, exploring relationship with them, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily interested in this, but if they were, it would be a huge advantage. Why, why, why wouldn't they be interested? I agree with you. If, they're, if their program of work is already full and they just don't have the capacity, but I think that they would be. Um, and like I say, that's 2,000 2, businesses between Portsmouth and the surrounding communities alone who are already members and engaged. I, I, and, and they, oh, there's been, so let, yeah, I'll let not, not to speak on behalf of all my um, colleagues at the other chambers, but I know Portsmouth is um, very much interested in this and has its own set of plans and, and ideas on how to do this. Um, my, my only other thought on this is, you know, I, I'm just concerned that the state and, and um, I had a conversation with Commissioner Caswell about this topic, you know, they kind of feel like they're tackling this and I'm, I don't know how much interest they would have in providing funding to something that is going to be in line with something they already think they're um, solving. So. Well, I, so my understanding know. of that, and we do have that um, coordination with BEA's new ARPA funded workforce attraction initiative, marketing initiative, right. and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I thought I heard was that they were going to go about it in a similar way that they go about tour tourism, attracting tourists. And so they're going to make it on a regional basis. Um, they're going to do something that would be more targeted to the seacoast, you know, kind of live, work, play in the seacoast. Um, so I think we would want to coordinate with that. But um, I don't think it would duplicate it. But correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Darren and Sean. Yeah, I think, well, I think there's, there's a couple, there's, there's appealing to individuals to come to the seacoast or to work on the seacoast, right? There's, there's that kind of whole New Hampshire initiative. But I think what we talked about last week was the fact that it's really the employers who have more control. In other words, I mean, and I'll just say what I, I think I said last week, like, just because you want to hire people, you can't make them come work for you. Right. So what are you going to do differently to attract them, to retain them, to demonstrate that this is not just a job. It is a career. And oh, by the way, here are the steps. Should you choose to grow your career or move it forward? Or we're just a great place to work. If you just want to come in and do your job and go home every night um, and, and live your life, that's OK, too. But we talked a lot about the culture and Warren brought it up a lot like what. Employers have the ability to distinguish themselves from their competitors down the street. And, and to, your, to your point, Robin, there's plenty of employers. I can assure you, most of them are not doing anything differently today. They're, they're hoping that the, labor's gonna, the labor force is going to come back. Um, so I think, and what we've seen here at Great Bay when we partner with employers is the ones that put some skin in the game, then invest some time and energy that distinguish themselves from their competitors when they attract more employees, they retain more employees, and they get higher productivity from their existing workforce. And I, I, so to me, that's, you know, the value we can bring is educating employers, especially smaller employers who don't have full-blown HR departments, let's say, or training and development departments, educating them on how they can how they can attract and retain and enhance their, their existing workforce. And in doing that, I think we would we would be providing case studies. I work with uh, clients who do get it, you know, 50 to 75 employees, even less. They do get it that that now high HR is more of a marketing game than it is an HR game. You've got to get people in the door. You've got to market, like Sean said, you've got to market your company around what are you providing you know look at look at john randolph as a as a, a case in point uh, relative to, to harmony homes he's providing housing for his employees 
what are you providing? Housing's expensive. I get it. Are, are you provide? I'm, I'm I'm working with a client now, and and she's they're looking to get a 401k program because I understand that that's a driver of of employees, mentoring, culture, access to childcare, um, uh, employee reimbursement for for education, mentoring. This is this is not another stop on your millennials 25 different careers that you're going to have over 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 the course of your career this is a longer stop than that and we will mentor you and create opportunity for you within within um the organization we've already identified six or seven different success stories or best practices that we have video ideas for so, um, you know, people say, yeah, will this come back? Will employees come back? We are in uncharted territory here, and it's, it's going on two years now. It's now t 21 months since the pandemic began. And um, I, I don't think we can plan on the 4 million exiting workforce employees per month over the past four months coming back we've from a from a micro point of view in the seacoast we've got to create opportunities for them that will incentivize them to come back john you've had your hand up for a bit thank you um, i just want to reiterate uh, what ben my colleague was saying um and to clarify that the uh, the two other chambers the uh, exeter and and hampton um when you combine those two also, we have well over a thousand members just in those two. So, I mean, we have thousands, when we talk about the five chambers in the Seacoast, uh, we have thousands of, of, of members. And um, I, I would just say very clearly that anything that th this chamber can do with regard to workforce uh, and working uh, with SEDS and, and anything that we can improve the, the whole workforce effort uh, with all of our business owners, that's our job. Um, it, it's not something that we uh, take lightly um, and that I think it's, it's really important that we're not doing our job if we're not uh, advising, counseling, and, and, and working in coordination with our business members uh, in the area of workforce. So I think what I'm hearing is that you know, generally this is um, a supportable idea. It seems to be serving a need. Some of our potential concerns are exactly how this would um, avoid reduplication of efforts. Um, so it seems like sort of the next phase of fleshing this out might be um, identifying some of the sp specific deliverables or topics and then doing another check through with um, BEA to make sure we understand exactly what their campaign is targeting, exactly what ours is targeting, how they're um, sort of working together um, and, and coordinating, but also accomplishing different things. Paul? Yeah, I, I think this is all great stuff, and um, I, I I can support it uh, in the direction it's going. One thing, though, I'm not hearing is, uh, although it's peripherally attached to, to case studies uh, and that sort of thing, I think what we've talked about is somewhat uh, stating the obvious. Everyone understands there's a problem. Um, it's reaching the solution, and I think communicating what resources are out there to assist them in solving those problems, uh, be it you know uh, childcare grants or, or, or I think we talked about something at our last meeting, some communities doing some something relative to, to childcare and expanding those opportunities. Um, I mean, I think certainly the Great Bay Community College is a resource that's, that's probably under uh, used uh, in many regards uh, in on this topic. Uh, they, they're 
people view them in a in a specific role, and that role has expanded. But I'm not sure everyone understands that how what role they play in solving those problems. So I think it's important to communicate to these employers not only is there a problem and you have to change, which then creates crises because <laughs> they're already they're already trying to uh, run their own businesses, uh, but not the the adage, you know, and, and we're here to help, uh, or that we're from the government and we're here to help, but more, you know, there are resources, public and privately funded resources uh, that you can plug into to start dealing with those issues that you've identified. Yeah, some of them need the little slap to the side of the head saying, no, you got to change. Uh, but uh, getting past that is then, okay, how? And they need that resource, how? Good point. And again, I think explore, and it's hinted throughout this, and I know we've all talked, but it's, I think it's the Chambers of Commerce are a tremendous potential partner if in fact they're interested in it, which Ben is suggesting they are. And, and as you, uh, probably you all know, the Chambers also have a cooperative. They meet regularly as we're meeting, and I, I think it would be, um, it would be a disservice to everyone if the, that partnership wasn't fully explored for this particular initiative. Um, so that brings us, if we have next steps, that brings us to uh, a little bit of a scheduling thing. If we were to come back for our next call, that would be Tuesday the 21st before uh, Christmas and or Tuesday the 28th immediately after Christmas. So I guess a uh, general show of hands, who would still be available to meet on the 21st um, if we were planning to come back next week? Seems like most of you. So we will plan on holding the call next week. Sean and team is a week turnaround doable for you guys to do a little bit more checking, chatting, refining. Well, I mean, yeah. I've got some availability. I'm not, we'll, if we, the three of us can get together and, and I think um, Barb wanted to join us, we'll, we could try to pull something together. I'll, I'll let the others respond. Yeah, I think it's 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 doable. We 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 already um, we've already gone a little bit beyond what what Sean talked about. So I think we've got some things pretty well set. You know, James, you had said next phase would be identifying the problems and the solutions. So I, I think I think we could get that done by next week if if all of our schedules can are in sync. Okay. Yeah, you know, and let us know if. Um, or let me know if there's anything else that you need. Um, yeah, I guess reach out to um, Teresa for some of the coordination with BEA if we need clarity on you know, what exactly they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I wanna leave a few minutes for the final group and I'm gonna stop sharing because I don't think I got anything from them. Um, so that was, Darren and team, you were looking at um, some of the Seacoast quality of life um, <laughs> stuff and uh, I guess some potential marketing materials related to that. So Darren? Uh, yeah, we, uh, it was myself and Charlie, Teresa and Dan. Dan, unfortunately, is out for an extended period and Reed's gonna join us. We have another meeting on Friday. Um, I would say that where we started and where we ended up uh, is, is not the same place. I think that uh, we sort of moved off a little bit of creating a, a product because of what BEA is coming up with. We obviously plan on working with them. As Teresa pointed out, it'll be a little while until they have um, you know, what they're gonna, what they're gonna come up with. And, and she's hoping that the Cedars can add input to that. So I would say we really don't have much unless Charlie and Teresa think otherwise until after we meet on Friday. We should have something for Tuesday is my guess. Yeah, I, yeah, I would agree. Same here. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, my my point was uh, be careful of spending the cedar money or any monies and time and effort 
uh, until we get a better handle on where the state is in their process. And if they're already spending the millions of dollars coming in from ARPA and um, the EDA monies, then they're creating the pipelines, the marketing collateral, the assets, toolboxes, um, get, waiting till we get a better understanding of what all of those pieces are and how the CEDAR can um, impl implement or how the CEDAR can feed into that. I do know with the marketing collateral for retention or retract recruitment of employees, um, I've been having discussions and I think there's agreement that they want local input and the easiest and most efficient way to get that kind of local input into whatever they develop is through the CEDAR. Okay, so that project may go from you know, we would like to hire a consultant who would prepare those materials to BEA is preparing the materials. We'll put our heads together and sort of come up with a list of this is what we would like the Seacoast materials to account for. Um, this is you know, who we would like them to be able to accommodate, uh, you know, both public and private businesses, recruiting people, um, and send those over to the BEA team that's working on them. Um, is where we might end up. Yes, and then maybe a couple yeah. very specific or very localized stories or um, points that put that, you know, the Dover special niche on it or the Dover story and then go to Portsmouth and, and give each that local because the state is going to go regional, but they can't really drive down to that local you know, each of you have your own culture, your own feel. So maybe that's where the Cedar can say, we have got all this from the state, but we can put the Dover spin on it and the Hampton spin and tell a, a unique thing about Portsmouth. So. Okay. So we will let you all put your heads together on Friday and see if you have a clearer direction of where that's going next week. Anything else for the group this morning? Cliff? Good morning. Thanks for um, having me be a part of the group. Um, and good morning, Jenny. And uh, Jenny wanted um, someone other than her to represent some of the arts commissions in the region too. So um, see, and as I sit on the Dover Arts Commission, I step forward. Um, I had a meeting at the stakeholders um, um, event meeting in Dover last Tuesday and Dan Barifaldi uh, and I were talking. Um, we at the Arts Commission have put together um, an entire part of the master plan for culture and recreation. We operate under the recreation department in Dover. And I was asking if um, this organization would like um, access to that piece that we put together for the master plan for any other city or any other town would that be of any help as we put this together uh yeah we could definitely forward that around um that was something that we had sort of talked about uh in the visioning process for you know some actions this group might be able to take was you know sample language for how to incorporate the arts into master plans in a policy um yeah, so I think once that product is you know, done and in a place to share, um, you know, we'd love to just send it around to the list so people can take a look, use it as an example, think about um, you know, some of their own processes or, or things like that. Yeah, sure. It's a living document and we just kind of went through and reviewed some of the priorities in it too, but I can send it to you, James, and then you can hold it for when you want to distribute it. How about that? Yeah, that would, that would be great. Thanks. James, I have an announcement. Okay. Uh, we have uh, hired a, a business resource specialist for the Seacoast. Um, he will start middle of January. So okay. um, I'll be transitioning him in. And uh, what I'm going to do is try to see if I can get um, anyone who wants to have an update meeting in the first quarter of next year with him and myself just uh, shoot me an email or let me know. 
and we'll begin to set up those meetings so you have a um, he has an opportunity to meet each one of you one on one and get your specific updates um, either for your town or your organization. I'd be happy to do that and uh, kind of get his calendar rolling and his incorporation into the seacoast going well. So. Can you announce who that is? Um, no, I cannot give out the uh, name at this point, but um, uh, we're really excited uh, with his background and um, he's going to bring a lot of positive energy and uh, a, he's got a good experience, good background um, in economic development, in uh, community development and collaboration. It's just in line with where we see our, our work going. Great, good news. Mm -hmm. um, I should have made you hold that for like another 10 seconds uh, so we could end on good news. Um, I just, I wasn't sure how many people had received Charlie's update um, we did hear back from EDA regarding the Build Back Better application. Um, our blue economy proposal was not selected for phase one. Um, so that won't be moving forward, at least not under that source um, with that money. Yeah, I will say James though, um, I think the proposal was solid. Um, there was another blue economy proposal from Rhode Island that was funded. I actually think ours was quite a bit stronger, but I think they probably had to make decisions about where to fund projects in Manchester. Um, Dean Kamen's proposal was funded, so um, I think there's some good projects in there, and I think we'll find other outlets for them, so I'm not worried about finding a venue. And in some ways, I'm a bit relieved to not have to spin up 10 massive projects, so... <laughs> But um, we'll find a venue for it. And just want to thank James, you, and, and everyone on this call for, for putting a lot of effort into that. So thank you all. Charlie, thank you to you for taking the lead. It was an amazing job. Again, it, co it coalesced what, what, what we've been trying to get accomplished over the past two years. And um, this is a culmination of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Charlie, Tina and I spoke about it. We're both devastated. <laughs> we're both devastated. We're like, no, we're not giving up on this. 500,000 is not un unattainable. And we're like, no, we're, we're going to make sure this stays on the radar. And we will always be looking for money to fund those, to fund that idea and that project. It's too important. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? For the group today. All right. Thank you all for your time, and we will see you next week. Thanks. See you next week.